Well, hello, everyone. This is Cynthia Tomain with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining today's webinar with CBOE Global Markets. I'm very pleased to have with us Russell Rhodes, who's going to be talking about option trading around earnings reports. So, Russell, uh, thanks very much for joining us. Let me go ahead. I'm going to make you the presenter. If you would uh, okay. share your screen, we'll get underway. I'm sharing my screen. I'm hitting let's go, and hopefully everything looks good on your end, and we are good to go. So um, thanks for the introduction, Cynthia. Uh, I'm Russell Rhodes. I've been with SIBO Global Markets for about nine years now, and I've been doing webcasts with Cynthia for about nine years as well. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, just how people trade options around earnings announcements, uh, basically going to use some examples from announcements last quarter, and actually going to use stocks that uh, people that were on the webcast that I did last month picked at the very end of last month's webcast. I said, what stocks do you guys want me to do? And basically, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, Tesla, uh, Bed Bath Beyond, AT&T, and NVIDIA, which is a really diverse group of stocks. I kind of like that. And, uh, glad it's not just, you know, Facebook, Google, Apple. Uh, but these were the first five that got named when I asked for suggestions. So I went back and looked at what the history was for each of these stocks as far as earnings price reactions went and found a couple of trades uh, for each of these stocks. I think one of them I actually came up with three trades uh, that people put on just before the market closed before they announced their earnings. Uh, I'll start off and say a few things about earnings announcements, but I think most people are, are pretty aware of uh, what they are and, and what kind of impact they actually earnings announcements actually have on uh, individual stocks. Uh, so four times a year, legally, U.S. companies have to report their financial results. And what happens is the stocks tend to adjust uh, or, uh, to the new information. Um, uh, back in back in the year 2000 or so, we got some new laws that that uh, required companies to to keep uh, information of themselves and then uh, announce this information to the whole investing public equally and all at the same time. So what's happened is we actually have a little bit more excitement around earnings announcements. Uh, now, what the option market does is the option market actually adjusts before and after uh, earnings announcements, and typically that means that uh, implied volatility of option contracts will go up as we get closer and closer to an earnings announcement, and then the implied volatility will come in uh, pretty dramatically after uh, we get the earnings announcement. And the the anticipation of the option prices, uh, it, it, it tends to mirror what's going on historically. It also tends to mirror uh, what may have happened in the most recent quarter. And one of the examples uh, that I have today, uh, you can actually see where the options are really braced for a very large move because the previous quarter, uh, the stock had, had the largest move in some time off of earnings. Uh, but the options uh, tend to, again, they tend to adjust before the announcement, and then they tend to uh, adjust after the announcement as well. Uh, so I'm just going to jump into examples. And uh, the first one was Goldman Sachs, and I'm actually uh, – going to use the most pre the previous quarter. I know Goldman uh, has reported, I believe they've reported uh, this quarter, but I'm actually uh, going to use the last quarter because uh, there's a little bit of a lag between when I finish these presentations and we put them, uh, we get them through the legal process and I get it into Cynthia's hands and then we come and talk about them. Um, so I'm just going to use the previous six quarters price reaction uh, today. Sometimes I'll use three years. It just, it depends on what I have available at times. Uh, so, and uh, I think on CNBC, you'll see the guys use the last two years. Uh, it varies uh, just based on different preferences. Uh, something I do like to concentrate on is the last quarter. Uh, and in this case, Goldman's average move was 2.4%. 3% up or down. Uh, it, the biggest gain was 2.15%. You can see the last five quarters leading up to this earnings announcement actually saw the uh, the stock drop based on their earnings announcement. And the previous quarter uh, had a drop of just 1.86%, which was a little bit less than uh, the stock moved on average based on an earnings announcement. Now, I went in and looked at the time and sales, uh, the evening. I like uh, Goldman reported 
uh, before the open on April 17th. So the trades I'm going to show you occurred in about the last five to 10 minutes on April 16th or just before the uh, the market closed uh, the day before they reported their earnings because they report, reported before the open. Uh, and the first trade I came across, and I, I think this one was uh, easily, uh, this one may have actually been within the last second of the trading day uh, the afternoon before they reported earnings, but somebody came in and did a bull put spread. Uh, they sold the 250 put and bought the 245 put and took in a credit of 57 cents. And what I like to do when I'm talking about earnings announcements is I like to show the payoff diagrams like this. And even though Goldman had, the stock had dropped, the last five quarters, uh, you know, the average move in the la the previous quarter was much less than this 3.2 percent. So as long as the stock didn't drop by 3.2 percent uh, after the earnings announcement into expiration that Friday, uh, this trade would profit by the uh, the credit of 57 cents that was taken in. Uh, I also like to highlight where the stock was trading at the time that the trade that the the trade was actually executed. So in this case, it's a bullish trade but it's a bullish trade with a really nice cushion. Uh, and again, that cushion is greater than the average move off of earnings. So I, I did a bullish trade here, and then I also did a bearish trade. And a little, just a, a little bit earlier, just a few minutes before this trade, uh, the one that I just showed, uh, somebody came in and did a bear call spread, and they actually sold the 265 call and bought the 270 call. And they were able to do this at a credit of 85 cents. Um, a little bit more of a credit, but also the uh, the strike that was being sold uh, is a little bit closer to uh, where where the stock was trading at the time, Slight, uh, slightly closer. Uh, and in this case, uh, their cushion. It, it, this is an interesting one because the the upside move to uh, to the short strike is 2.3 percent, which is pretty close to that average move of 2.43 percent. Uh, but remember that. Uh, again, Goldman had uh, the stock had traded off the previous five quarters in reaction to earnings. So, uh, yeah, if, if you're going with uh, the recent trend, a uh, bearish trade may may make a little bit more sense than a bullish trade. The bullish trade in this case had a little bit more of a cushion, had that three plus percent cushion. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, as long as the stock is not up 2.3 percent over the balance of the week after they report earnings, uh, this trade you know, both options expire with no value and you know the result is a profit equal to the credit that was taken in when the trade was done uh, and one other comment before I, I show the result uh, I'm going to show a price chart of what Goldman Sachs stock did in reaction to earnings and through expiration uh, just one other thing that I'd like to point out is both of the trades that I showed uh, do have defined risk uh, I, I, I showed a, a bull, bull put spread and a bear call spread and especially around earnings because you know the the price Price history is, is a pretty accurate uh, number to work with, with a handful of exceptions each quarter. And you hate to not have your, you know, not have some sort of risk control, like in this case, we own the 270 call if we had done this trade. Uh, yeah, I, I just I like to throw a little bit of caution out there with respect to earnings announcements because we do get a handful of outliers each quarter and if you're thinking about doing a trade around earnings you do want to make sure that you have uh the uh the potential downside uh you know defined and it's something that if you do end up on the wrong side of one of these things uh that that's not going that 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 you'll still be around to play another day after uh, after doing that trade and what we got here was we actually I'm going to find my Spotlight. Uh, this was the earnings reaction right here. This was the, uh, the um, and we actually uh, didn't get much of a reaction this time uh, out of Goldman Sachs. Remember, the short strike on the upside was up here around 265, and the short strike on the downside was 250. And even after the earnings announcement, uh, we never violated either of those. So this is a case where both the the bullish trade and the bearish trade worked out all right because didn't get much of a, a, a move out of Goldman uh, in reaction to earnings this uh last earnings season, actually. Uh, got much less than that 2.3%. Uh, so...
a bullish and a bearish trade, and uh, everybody wins in this case, uh, at least with respect to those two trades in front of earnings. Now, this is the one I was kind of excited to get to, uh, and this is, needless to say, a stock that has been in the uh, in the news as of late because uh, their CEO has been in the news as of late. Uh, so, what I liked about this one, and again, uh, you know, I, I noticed that a handful of people have joined since we got going. The stocks that I'm talking about today were actually picked by people on the previous uh, webcast that I had for Interactive Brokers. So uh, I had I, I was told what to work with. And I was really happy when I saw this with respect to uh, Tesla. Uh, right here, the biggest loss in the previous six quarters and the biggest move in the last six quarters uh, was actually the previous quarter and one of the things that i have noticed looking at watching earnings announcements over the past few years is when you when, when the previous quarter has been uh, the biggest move higher or lower uh, the option the implied volatility of the options going into the next quarter uh, tends to, uh, to 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 be a bit high and there are a couple of trades uh, that uh, there's one trade in particular that I know is getting ready to come up that that uh, is really bracing or, or is taking advantage of the option market bracing for some sort of big move out of Tesla the previous quarter. Uh, I know uh, Tesla reports the first week of August, so uh, the next go round is coming coming pretty soon. And I think uh, I, I know that uh, this is a critical year for Tesla, so the option market is probably going to be bracing uh, for a lot of uh, movement around the different news events around this stock. So the first trade, and this one's uh, with Tesla at 301.13, again, shortly before the market closed. Uh, the um, the on They reported after the close on May 2nd, so this was shortly before the market closed on May 2nd. Uh, somebody came in and did an iron condor, uh, looking at a, you know, a wide range of outcomes out of the out of Tesla over the next two days after they report their earnings announcement, they reported after the close on the second. So we had the third and the fourth for price reaction. Uh, they sold the 260 put with the stock at 301. That's down 40 points. They sold the 345 call. Uh, that's up almost 45 points from where the stock was trading. And then uh, they, they bought the wings on this iron condor, and they basically went out just five points. Took in a net credit of $0.49, cents with, and you've got a risk of $4.51 here. This is what I really liked about this trade. Uh, and and there, I'm not going to say I really liked every trade that, that I put in here. Uh, but in this case, uh, Tesla, th this trade makes money as long as Tesla doesn't lose 13.7% or rally 14.6% off of earnings. And you know, I, I'm not going to back up, but the biggest move in the last year and a half had been a little over 8%, and it happened in the previous quarter. I, I've just noticed that it, historically when We've had a big move the previous quarter, or a bigger move than average the previous quarter. These kind of opportunities pop up where you can find uh, you know, a wide range of possibilities to make money off of a trade. Uh, and you know, this down 13.7 or up 14.6%, that is uh, you know, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty wide berth as far as uh, you know, this iron condor goes or a, a, a neutral trade like this, even though it's into earnings. But uh, the option premiums were quite elevated and creating an interesting opportunity here. Uh, and then another uh, another trade that came along was somebody had a bullish outlook. And um, I wasn't particularly wild about this trade since I was so excited about one, I had to find one that that I, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, excitement around. <laughs> and that's the case right here where they sold the uh, 280 put and bought the uh, 270 put. They took in a dollar eighty three and when you look at the range of or how the profitability works, remember the the previous quarter the stock had dropped more than eight percent or so uh, and yeah I, I, I felt like if I had uh, if, with how elevated the premiums were, if this were a trade I were doing, and again, I just pull these trades 
um, off the time in sales just before the market closes um, the day before they're going to report their earnings. I might have gone down to the 270, maybe sold the 270 and bought the 260 and had more of a cushion of 10.4% instead of 7.1%. But, uh, you know, and, and I selected this trade so I could, you know, maybe discuss that, discuss you know, throw that out there a little bit that, uh, you know, the 7.1% 7, 7 is greater than the average move, but, uh, you know, not within the uh, the range of uh, what had happened recently in, in the most recent quarter. So I, I like the first trade an awful lot. This one I'm, I'm kind of lukewarm toward and, uh, and consider it more of a uh, teaching opportunity. So the net result here for, for Tesla was the stock actually gapped down off of earnings and then started to work its way back up. Now that second trade, the first trade was never in danger. Uh, we did get a, a, a nice gap down, pull my spotlight, nice gap down in, in Tesla and then it rebounded a little bit. But uh, this was a viable, you know, right here, the stock was in that range where if you had sold the 280 and bought the 270, uh, on the put side, you probably were were sweating it a little bit initially. Uh, if you if you held on to your trade, which when the when you've got a defined risk like you do when you do a, a vertical spread, uh, makes it a little bit easier to ride that out. But um, you know if you're able to ride it out, the stock did go back to a point where uh, you know there was no danger of that second trade, the bull put spread being uh, violated. The uh, the the iron condor that I showed uh, was never in danger, even though you had a, an interesting gap lower in uh, Tesla stock price off of earnings. Uh, that that iron condor, uh, because it was because it had such a wide potential range of profitability, uh, it, it really it may have been my favorite trade of of all the ones that I searched out for the five stocks that were were dictated to me by you guys. Um, so then uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, which I, I, I was like, that's kind of an unusual one when, when the name was thrown out at me. But then I saw that the stock had basically uh, gotten just pummeled the previous four quarters around earnings, uh, you know, basically always losing more than 10 percent on average, losing uh, on average, moving 12 and a quarter percent. But, you know. Five of the last six, five of the previous six reports, uh, and and we actually have a pretty recent report with uh, Bed Bath and Beyond. Uh, they reported after the close on June 27th, uh, but uh, another instance of goodness gracious, I mean, almost a 20% drop off of earnings, a 19.95% drop off of earnings, uh, didn't necessarily create the same sort of opportunities that that we had in Tesla. Uh, you know, maybe there's been some exhaustion with respect to uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. I know retail has been a difficult place to be uh, as of late. Now, this trade, I just, um, you know, they, they bought, somebody came in and bought the, the June 29th, they had a couple of days after the report, uh, 22 call for 56 cents. Um, and I'm just going to go right here. The break even was up 12.7%. Remember what the stock had been doing off of earnings. Uh, I'm, you know, looked at this trade and I got, and it was actually done in size. And my belief, and there's no way for me knowing this, but my belief is somebody was buying some calls in front of earnings because they're short the stock. The only reason that I could come up with somebody doing a trade like this in front of earnings is, uh, is you know, protection against a big move to the upside. I can't imagine uh, with a stock that has basically done this over the last year and a half that, I mean, even the average move is 12.25%. But uh, as poorly as the stock had been reacting to fundamentals, I just have a hard time believing that somebody that bought this out of the money call just before the market closed, before earnings, uh, was doing so as a speculative trade. I really think that was more of a hedging transaction uh, because the break even is so high. And then somebody also sold the June 20, the BBBY. I, I, 
left a B out of the uh, the ticker there, but sold the uh, the Bed Bath and Beyond June 29th 1850 puts for 60 cents, and that wasn't real wild about that trade either. Uh, you typically, uh, if you're thinking about selling, uh, you know, if you're selling puts. Uh, I believe you normally want to sell puts because you, you'd like to buy the stock at uh, some sort of a discount. Uh, when the stock has dropped more than 10% off of earnings the previous uh, previous year, uh, I think maybe you want to sell puts lower. Uh, may, if you're going to sell puts, maybe buy an even lower put just to protect yourself if you really think you're only going to get a 10% down move. Uh, but this trade right here, uh, after seeing how the stock had reacted to earnings over the last uh, year, this stock, uh, this trade, neither of these trades um, are, are were attractive to me. Which, and that's fine. I think we can learn from uh, trades that people are doing that we're not particularly wild about. In fact, you know, in this case, maybe you'd want to buy those puts down 7.6 percent when the stock's normally dropping. Uh, 10 to 20 percent off of earnings and actually this quarter was dull um, uh, again the uh, much like Tesla the stock gapped lower uh, and then started to work its way back this is the this is the earnings reaction right here uh, if you had sold those 1850 puts which if you had been assigned on them would have resulted in buying the stock at an effective price of 1790 it's about where the stock got off of earnings, and then it rebounded. So, uh, unlike the previous four quarters, uh, the, the stock was lower off of earnings, but not nearly to the extent that uh, that it had lost over the previous four quarters. And then, AT and T was offered up as a uh, as a stock to take a look at around earnings. They reported after the close back in April. So the trades I'm gonna talk about here were done on April 25th, leading into uh, the earnings announcement, just minutes before the market closed. Uh, it, it had had a 4.5% rally in the previous quarter. Uh, on average, the stock had moved just a little bit under 3%. Uh, the trades here actually do, I believe, do take into account this, uh, these price movements. Uh, this trade here, uh, you know, taking in only a credit of nine cents, selling the 36 call and buying the 36 and a half call, a uh, pretty bearish trade since we're only up 75 cents or so from where the stock was trading at the time. Uh, took in a credit of nine cents and we're risking 41 cents. So you really are hoping. Uh, that stock moves lower off of earnings, uh, you know, just not a whole lot of a gap in there. Uh, and in this case, you only have a 2.2% uh, you know, between the uh, the short strike and uh, where the stock was trading at, at the time. You only have 2.2% of a cushion, which is much less than the average move, much less than uh, the two bullish moves that we had seen in the previous quarters, and even 3.6%, which is the, uh, the, the, the long strike, uh, is even lower than uh, you know, what had been a normal move for, uh, definitely a normal bullish move for AT&T. So uh, this trade is, a, even though there's a, a bit of a cushion between the short strike and where the stock was trading, I still think this is a pretty aggressively bearish trade uh, because they're, they're, because of the the gap between the stock price and the strike price relative to what the stock has done off, done historically around earnings. And then somebody actually, uh, I actually liked this trade. Um, I don't like all the trades, but I, I found this one pretty interesting. Uh, one of the big, uh, in my career with SIBO, one of the big things that I always throw out there is uh, trying to overcome time decay one way or another. And uh, at and it was trading at 3507 and somebody bought, they went out an extra week. They actually went out to May 4th as opposed to the expiration right after earnings. And they paid $1.58 for the 3650 puts. Now I like this trade because 
there's only about 15 cents of time value. Uh, and um, the in, in the other side, this is a bearish trade with very little time value in here. And beyond that, uh, if if the stock moved in the opposite direction, uh, you know, if, if it, we got a bullish move, you'd probably still have some time value in this option. And in fact, if we got like the 5% time bullish move, uh, this put option would suddenly be the at the money option contract, which used, uh, usually does a pretty good job of retaining some of the time value. There would have been a volatility crush, um, but in front of earnings, I think giving up a little bit of time value like you like you would be doing in this trade uh, makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, it's uh, you know it, it's makes a little bit more sense if you've got a bearish outlook than shorting the stock outright because of the theoretically unlimited risk with respect to uh, shorting the stock. But this very little you know buying an in the money option with very little time value. And I think that's 15 cents of time value right in there. Uh, and knowing that you have some limited losses with respect to if you're wrong, and especially around earnings, uh, I think you know, taking into account possibly being wrong is always a worthwhile venture. Uh, you know, that I think that makes an awful lot of sense in this case. And then the outcome is the stock actually did gap lower. So the bear call spread worked out particularly well. And buying that put option worked out particularly well as well. Now, this is a chart. I've got two price charts for AT&T in this case. Uh, this just shows through expiration for the options that were in the bear call spread. And this next chart shows that we got a gap lower and then the stock continued to trend down to around 32 or so. Uh, so that 36.50 option, that uh, that 36.50 um strike put option uh, was about 450 in the money uh, the week after the earnings announcement. So that was a really good, uh, really good trade. Uh, it, it had a defined risk. If it had worked against you, it would it would have been a little bit painful. But um, you know, a, a nice way to be short the stock and not giving up a whole lot of time value and also being able to participate if the stock had continued to trend lower uh, you're not capping any of your losses and uh, you not you're not capping any of your potential gains on the move lower because uh, you didn't sell an option to offset the time value you the trader went out to the next expiration which um, you know probably doesn't have as much uh, it doesn't have as high as of implied volatility as the ones that expire right after earnings and went in the money to uh, to take care of some of that time value. So uh, it probably goes down as my second favorite trade behind uh, the Tesla Iron Condor, which I think was um, you know just a, somebody came across some really expensive options and took advantage of that. And then Nvidia, uh, this is kind of opposite of the Tesla situation, where yeah, and and the AT and T situation, where uh, those stock and the Bed Bath and Beyond, all three of those stocks had had very large moves in the more recent history. Uh, Nvidia had their big gains or their big outlier moves uh, earlier in the history. Uh, in fact, uh, the biggest gain was uh, a year and a half prior to reporting their earnings in May and you know their average move was around 10%, they'd only moved 6.69% uh, in the previous quarter. In fact, the previous three quarters had been smaller moves than uh, the stock had experienced historically. Uh, so uh, even though we'd had the, the smaller moves, somebody actually came in and, and took advantage of uh, you know, the elevated implied volatility. They also took advantage of uh, there being a uh, the ability with Nvidia to trade to uh, to uh, trade an iron condor that only has the wings two dollars and fifty cents outside of where uh, the short options are. They sold the two thirty seven fifty puts and the two eighty calls when the stock was around two sixty, and this results in a range based on the previous three quarters, which is pretty attractive. You know, the previous three quarters, uh, the moves had been in the five to six percent range, and in this case, uh, you know, that they had a range of down 0.87% or up 7.6%. So had a, again, a nice wide berth, kind of like the Tesla trade earlier, not as wide relative to long-term history, but uh, you know, probably focusing more on the last two or three quarters than the longer-term history. 
And then another trade that came in, and, and this one is the measured move trade that a lot of people like to put on. Uh, I, I'm These are very, 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 uh, you, you're really trying to thread the needle in this case. And uh, the cost of this trade is $1.89. Uh, the net potential profit is, uh, I believe, $8.11. Uh, what you're doing here is you're buying the 252 and a half put, selling two of the 242 and a half puts, and then going down to the 230s. Uh, the and it's a it's a actually bearish broken wing butterfly, um, and <clears throat> what they're shooting for here is a move that's that's kind of in line with the average move over the previous three quarters or so. Uh, one of the things I'm not real wild about with respect to this trade is. Uh, you know, although the really large moves had been to the upside, the stock had moved, you know, 20 plus percent off of earnings uh, in the past 30, I think almost 30 percent uh, in recent history. So but those moves had been to the upside, which would have resulted in a loss equal to the premium paid. But what they're really shooting for here is something, uh, you know, landing where I'm bouncing around with the uh, the highlighter right now, uh, down around 7% or so, which is kind of close to uh, the, the previous three-quarter moves. Uh, but this is uh, – there are people that are big proponents of uh, taking what, what the stock normally does around earnings, picking a direction, and putting on a trade like this. You've got to get the direction right. You've got to get the magnitude right. Uh, these trades are really uh, – you know, they're – you, you've got to have a, uh, a very strong conviction to uh, to put a trade like this on. Uh, I specifically went looking for one of these because uh, because there there are people out there that really encourage this type of trade, and I, I want to throw a little bit of caution out about how specifically correct you need to be in order to uh, to profit for a trade on a trade like this. And so Nvidia off earnings. Uh, stock actually worked its way up a little bit and then came back down a little bit, but uh, that measured move trade did not work uh, very well at all. Uh, the um, you know even well the measured move trade I've got to I've got to add a uh, whoop, sorry um, the measured move trade involved a, uh, a potential move to the downside and the stock actually rallied off of earnings. Uh, and then kind of settled back in. NVIDIA has been a huge beneficiary of the um, of the, the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency thing. They make uh, chips that are used in the mining process, uh, hence the very large move off of earnings uh, a while back. So, you know, with that, I just, you, you guys gave me five stocks, <clears throat> excuse me, and I went out and found some trades that, that you know, appeared to uh, be taking somewhat of the history into account. Some trades I liked, some trades I didn't like. I think sometimes it's uh, worthwhile to, uh, to actually talk about the trades that it wasn't really wild about. Uh, you know, we uh, at SIBO, uh, we have some people that, that continue to blog about the markets on a pretty regular basis. And uh, whenever the exchange is, is doing anything, uh, you know, we, they, we've got uh, risk management conferences coming up in the fall, webcasts that will be kicking off in the fall as well. Uh, you can always find out about that kind of stuff at on Twitter. Uh, and then I uh, have included my Twitter handle on here. Uh, you don't necessarily have to follow me, but if you're trying to track me down and got questions, uh, that is the best way to get hold of me. So uh, I don't see questions. Cynthia, are you close by? She's I certainly close by. am. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here, uh, and I oh I do see a question come in. Oh, uh, there you go. But I want to remind <laughs> Nick is always good for those questions. But I do want to oh, yeah. uh, remind everyone there that um, there's also a questions uh, title title bar in your control panel where if you do have questions for Russell, now's the time to put them in. All right, I'll let you uh, handle these questions, Russell. Sure, um, Nick. Uh, the the strike prices in this case around earnings are really the the ones that I would pick out uh, the and and say that I like uh, tend to match up well with the recent earnings history, um, or you know. It, 
or in the case of, uh, you know, if you're if you're very directionally biased, if you think stock's going to trade down off of earnings, you know, selling an at the money uh, bear call spread kind of makes sense in that case. Um, you know, I don't really, I I wouldn't use 15 minute chart to to uh, pick strikes that I was going to sell on a bear call or a bull put spread, uh, but support and resistance I think is a really good place to start if you're combining technical analysis and um, and option trading. Uh, if you're thinking about you know selling a bear call spread or a, a bull put spread uh, and doing so uh, not around earnings but just around regular price action, I think uh, support and resistance levels uh, are a great place to start with the short strike and the direction as well. Uh, and then a uh, question about trading options after the open after earnings. Um, you know, I, I wish I were doing another webcast right now because <laughs> that's a great idea. I've done that before. Uh, you tend to still be able to uh, benefit from uh, if, if you don't feel like the market has adjusted enough around an earnings announcement. And uh, yeah, I'll give you a, a couple. I'll just go back and take a look at the AT&T example. Um, you know, this stock, uh, you know, gapped lower. And if you felt like uh, it, it was going to continue with the trend as it did over the next week and a half, uh, you tend to be, uh, you, know, you you tend to have people that have bought options for a, uh, a, a play around earnings or a hedge around earnings that are looking to exit. So there's usually pretty good liquidity around uh, the open the next day. Uh, there's also uh, because you've got a lot of you've got a lot of extra activity, uh, especially around the open. I think if you've got a pretty strong conviction uh, that that uh, either the stock is going to continue to trend, or you know I'll go back to the the Tesla chart. Or if you think that maybe things are overdone and the stock's going to bounce back up, uh, there's still opportunities to trade uh, after the um, after the announcement. Uh, you don't get the full volatility crush until about midday, the first day after um, the announcement. Uh, so uh, you got to take that into account as well. Um, it's uh, the the times that I've paid really really close attention to. Uh, stocks after the announcement and and what's going on in the options uh, it seems to me that the full volatility crush doesn't kick in until we're at least halfway through the trading day that's it reacting to earnings another thing that you need to keep into account is earning the earnings announcement and I, I wish I had included this in my first slide the earning an announcement is actually two things it's the initial announcement and then the conference call and sometimes when a company reports in the morning their conference call will stretch into the market hours and you need to be aware of that if you're thinking about because they can say things on the conference call that can result in a change in the uh, the in what the stock is doing in reaction to earnings very quickly. So I just want to keep that in mind as well. Uh, Bert asked if it's being recorded. Yes, this is being recorded, and I appreciate you saying that this was excellent analysis. Uh, earnings have always been a, a big area of interest for me, probably for my whole career. Uh, so it's something I enjoy talking about. Well, that definitely came through today, Russell. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> <laughs> um, so with that, we are going to end today's session. I have oh, to say, let me, let me um, say what's oh. about. Let me just say with that. volatility, it took, I used a trader term that I shouldn't have used. A volatility crush just means that, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the call that the implied volatility of options tends to be elevated going into an earnings announcement, and then it, and the implied volatility after the news has been released uh, and the stock starts to react, uh, the volatility, the implied volatility of the options comes back down to uh, historically normal levels, and that's what I meant by the volatility crush. And Nick's saying, when do you get out? Uh, typically after the announcement, yeah, if you're doing the trade based on what you expect uh, the stock to do around earnings, uh, once that has passed, uh, typically I think you would, um, you know, 
want to get out of the trade. Now, that AT&T trade that was using the following week's expiration, uh, they may have expected some sort of follow through as well, and that's why they went another week out. Uh, but you should have your exit plan in place ahead of time. And typically, you know, I say if it's if you're trading because you think you because you have an opinion about what the stock's going to do, uh, you may want to exit after the announcement. Now, if you are doing something like this trade right here, and the and neither short strike was ever in danger of being hit, this is the Tesla trade. Uh, in this case, you're probably going to want to hold it through expiration and have all options expire with no value. And the, uh, you know, Jerry just asked, does the volatility crush uh, appear during the trading session? My experience, whoops, and every, um, uh, 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 bear with me one second. We're starting over. Um, my experience is that the, uh, the volatility doesn't immediately adjust uh, with the next trading, with, you know, with the new trading session or the first trading session after earnings. It's, it seems like it adjusts as the day goes along, usually uh, fully adjusts by sometime after lunchtime or so. Uh, and I use a couple of different quotes. Or, uh, I just look at the time and sales to come up with these spread trades that I, that I saw before earnings. Both of us seem to be waiting for just one more question. Yeah, I was just, uh, yeah, I was just waiting. So <laughs> pausing because every time every time we get going, we get another one. So I <laughs> we're both being well. What I'll I'll start right now by reminding everyone that we have been recording today's session, and each of you will get a direct link in about an hour or so uh, to today's recorded playback. I'll also be including a link to the PDF version of today's slides. So if you do want to come back and review the concepts that Russell went through today, simply watch your inbox and you'll get the information. By the way, this is also going to be posted on the Interactive Brokers website. Underneath the education menu, you'll find a webinar section where you can locate today's event, but also if you do use uh, the filtering that's available on that page, go in and filter by presenter and what you'll find is a plethora of options, um, <clears throat> webinars that Russell has done for us over the last nine years. So I do want to point that out. He mentioned a previous one on trading um, earnings announcements, so uh, please check that one out as well. So with that, a great deal of thanks to Russell Rhodes um, <clears throat> for today's presentation and uh, the entire library that we do have of events that Russell has brought to us. Also want to thank um, CBOE Global Markets for making today's event possible. So with that, we are going to conclude our event today. Once again, thanks, Russell, and I want to thank all you of you for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, and thanks so much. Uh, you can exit today's event using the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.